final week in our Christmas series called Christmas Unplugged. Hopefully it was a good Christmas for you guys. We are right on the cusp of a brand new year. Pretty excited about that. 2014, huh? Yes, yes. Some of you are like, it can't get any worse, right? Some of us had a great 2013. Some of us a not so great 2013. But with the equalizer between all of us is that we have 2014 right around the corner. It's what we make of it, you know, and we have the power and potential to make, make the best year of our lives. But what's that thing they do at the end of every year and the beginning of New Year? They make New Year's resolutions, right? I mean, make New Year's resolutions. There's all kinds of different things that we can make resolutions about. In fact, you know, the idea behind a resolution is just to make the next year even better, right? To do more cool stuff, to do more good stuff. What's some examples of some uh, resolutions that people make sometimes? Any ideas? Lose weight, right? That's probably like the number one, right? Lose weight, right? What else? What else? Give me another one. Less fast food, all right? A little less McDonald's, all right? What else? Go to church more often. <laughs> yeah, I like that guy. That's all right. Who, uh, huh? Buy a Mac? That's a resolution? All right, good. Uh, that's a goal, all right? We're going to... Next week, we're going to talk about the difference between goals and resolutions, all right? So, uh, but, but there's all kinds of different things that we can do, that we can do as a resolution. In fact, I employ the help of some cats to really go through the top 10 resolutions that may be made this year here. Uh, check this out. guys saw some. You're like, man, that's a good one. I didn't even really think about that one. You know, there's all these different kind of resolutions that we can make coming at the end of one year into the beginning of another. But one thing I want to let you know is these, uh, this idea of a New Year's resolution is nothing new. I mean, it's been around for centuries. In fact, you know, I really wanted to know because we're going to be talking about resolutions. Where do resolutions come from? And I actually found this video and sort of traced it all the way back to the very beginning. Here, check this out. Hey, hey. I just asked that girl out. Nice. Nice, yeah. <laughs> Is that part of your resolution? New Year's resolutions. One of those ideas that seem to have existed forever. But it did have a beginning a long time ago. The New Year's holiday was first celebrated approximately 4,000 years ago in Babylon. However, the Babylonians did not have an official written calendar, so they observed the holiday in March during the early beginnings of spring. During this time, the Babylonians would make promises to their gods, usually entailing paying their debts. Shedding a few pounds didn't seem to be on top of their minds. Then, in Roman times, as different emperors took the throne, the calendar began to change. In 153 BC, the Roman Senate ruled that the new year would officially begin on January 1st. The Romans would make vows to their god Janus, after whom the month of January was named. They would commonly ask for forgiveness and exchange gifts. In 46 BC, Julius Caesar altered the months yet again and he made the year last for 445 days. It was during the reign of Caesar that resolutions became more recognized with people making promises such as showing kindness to others. Still, no sign of Weight Watchers. In medieval times, knights reaffirmed their commitment to chivalry as a yearly tradition. To this day, the tradition of New Year's resolutions and getting rid of past bad luck continues. Various countries have differing approaches. At the stroke of midnight in Wales, a back door is opened and then shut to release the luck of the past year. Spain residents eat 12 grapes at midnight to bring good luck in the coming months. What's your New Year's resolution? You know, I thought 
found that to be real interesting, you know? I mean, uh, these different ideas, but to see that this idea of a resolution has been around for a really, really long time. Now, I understand that sitting in this room right now are two groups of people when it comes to resolutions. One group that's here, you guys, you love to make New Year's resolutions. You've already planned them out. In fact, you're doing things now that you're not going to do on the first, and you tell yourself, I got till the first to do these things. Are you that guy? You know what I mean? Like, oh, I got three more days that I can do it, and then I'm going to quit smoking, right? That's my New Year's resolution. I'm, I'm going to be free from this, but if it's going to be on this day. You know, you know we make resolutions. Now, that's one group that's here. Now, there's a group on the other side, however. And the group on the other side, you guys are opposed to New Year's resolutions. You don't make resolutions. You're like, I did that once, bought the T-shirt, doesn't work, right? I'm not going to do that anymore. And so you're anti-resolution. Are there any anti-resolutioners out there? All right, some people in the back, yeah. Well, I'm not going to make any resolutions. I'm just going to live my life the way I'm living my life. Now, I understand that I'm speaking to two parties, so here's what I want to do. I want to, if you're here and you're the resolution people, and you say, I've already made it, I already know what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to really cause you to really look at your resolutions through the eyes of God's word and see, are these resolutions worthy of what God would have you do in your life, okay? And if you're here and you're the anti-resolution bunch, right, you're not going to do it. I'm going to challenge you to set some resolutions because I think our lives always could use tweaking and changing and always to be able to honor God in our lives in the way that we live, okay? So I'm going to communicate with both of you. So why don't you grab your Bible? Um, remember, God's Word is the most important thing in your life. I want you guys to have a Bible. Bring a Bible. If you don't have one, grab one from right underneath your seat. Hopefully, we got one there for you. If you don't have a Bible, you take that Bible home with you. It's our gift to you because we really want you to have a Bible in your life, okay? And we're going to open up to the book of Matthew. Just open your Bible about two-thirds of the way through, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to go to Matthew 22, the 22nd chapter in the book of Matthew. And we're going to start in verse 34, okay? We're going to read about an encounter that Jesus is going to have with the religious person and what he's going to say. Uh, so here it is right here, Matthew 22, starting in verse 34, says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, okay? One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Now, let's break this down just a little bit for us to help us understand it better. The Pharisees got together. The Pharisees were like uh, re really religious Jewish individuals. So the Sadducees were also a group of really religious li uh, 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 Jewish individuals. However, maybe the Sadducees were seen as being a little uh, more liberal than the Pharisees, all right? Jesus shows up the Sadducees, and so the Pharisees get together and are like, no, we got to come up with something for him right? We're going to get him now. And so they find someone from their group that is an expert in the law. Now, what that means is sort of the equivalent of a lawyer, right? But he's like a lawyer when it comes to God's word. And so he knows the scripture, the laws, the tradition inside and outside. He is well versed. So he comes up with this plan and he comes up with this question that he's going to ask Jesus. And the question is going to stump Jesus. And then he's going to show that he's better than Jesus or smarter than Jesus or more religious than Jesus. That's his plan, okay? Now, he goes before Jesus, and the question he asks is a really interesting question because he says this, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, you got to know that there's all kinds of commandments that the Jewish people would follow, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And so this lawyer, when he comes to Jesus, he says, out of these hundreds of laws, Jesus, what is the most important one? Some would think that that couldn't be answered. But Jesus, without batting an eye, looks at this lawyer right between the eyes, and he makes a statement because he knows what the greatest commandment is. And we read it in the next verse. The next verse, verse um, 37, we read this, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. He says, and this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. 
And so we hear the answer of Jesus saying, okay, you, you want to know what it's all about? You want to know what life's about? It's simply this. He said, love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. I want you to become that expression of love to the people that surround you. Okay, so that becomes in our life this strainer, let's say, that all the decisions of our life have to go through. Now, especially when we're talking about these New Year's resolutions that we're going to make, we got to ask ourselves and allow this resolution to go through the strainer of loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, and look at it in that perspective. Now, some of your resolutions aren't going to make it through the strainer, because some of your re resolutions are about me, 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 I, I, I. It doesn't honor God at all. It doesn't honor your neighbor at all. It's not about loving God. It's not about loving your neighbor. If it's all about I, 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 me, 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 it's not going to make it through the strainer of loving God. Does that make sense? All right, so you take what makes it through. This is a resolution I have. It's going to either love God or it's going to love my neighbor. Then I'm going to express God's, God's love in a practical way. And when you allow just those things to go through, these resolutions have the uh, ability to become the life direction for your 2014, for this upcoming year. These resolutions can lead and guide you closer to God and closer to your neighbor, fulfilling the call of what God has for your life. So... Today, what I want to do is I just want to look at the top three, the top three resolutions that are out there. And it's interesting because every single service today, I ask the same question. And the number one thing when I said, guys, what's a resolution that you have? Again and again and again, I would hear, get in shape, get fit, lose weight. I mean, this every person said this you know it has to be the number one resolution i'm going to get in shape and i'm going to eat right and exercise and be healthy and drink water and eat tofu and quinoa and lots of carrots right i'm going to hydrate and diet and cut out white sugar and white flour and anything that is white right i mean we get this mentality we're going to be extreme right because i got to be healthy and that's what it's all about have you been there i have we all have you know, some of us gained too much weight, some of us lost too much weight, and it becomes something that you want to do something about. So you decide that it is the first of the year and that you're going to do something about it. And i got to be honest, I think that's great. I think being healthy is a great thing, and I think that we should exercise. But the number one Christian response when I hear anyone who's going to exercise, watch what they eat, be healthy, is consistently, I got to do this because my body is a temple. You guys have heard it. Everybody's heard it. My body is a temple. That's, that's what so many individuals say. My body is a temple. I got to watch what I eat. My body is a temple. I got I to gotta exercise. I got to be strong because that's what God would have me do. Now, the problem is that when we read Scripture, that we need to read Scripture within context of what it says. And it's really interesting because if we read this verse where people get this from, it's in this book called 1 Corinthians. Corinthians, which was a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And it was 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen to the context behind this statement, my body is a temple. So here's, here's what it says. It says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body do you not know that your bodies are temples of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have received from god you are not your own you were bought at a price therefore honor god with your bodies so, you know, we get this idea, I'm going to exercise, why? My body is a temple, and we want to preach it and say it, but we got to read it in context. So if you really want to use that verse in your life, it would refer more to you viewing porn or sleeping with your boyfriend than it would with you going to the gym or eating more carrots this year. Do you understand? Your body is a temple. has to do with your sexual life, not your physical life. 
So that's context. So we've got to look at the scripture within context. In light of this verse, maybe we need to alter our list a little bit. Instead of running three miles a day, we walk away from a relationship that is built on lust, not built on love. Maybe instead of eating a salad every day, we get real about the level of sexual perversion that we are allowing into our minds each and every single day. You see, Scripture in context gives us a greater clarity of what we are supposed to do. So now next time you say, my body is a temple, let's make that statement in context and say, you know what, I'm watching this thing, I'm seeing these things that is not healthy. My body is a temple, I'm now going to walk away from that computer screen and not check out that porn. Or, or we're in a situation and things are getting heated up and we're going to make the statement, you know what, my body is a temple, we're not going to go there tonight. We need to change this relationship, we need to change how we're living, and we begin to walk in this other direction. Because if we're going to make that statement, let's make it true about our lives. Now, maybe for some of us, our resolutions just changed. Maybe for some of us, our resolutions are saying, oh, wow, that our, what's, watch this, what's happening inside is more important than what's happening outside. Do you know God cares more about your mind than he does about your biceps? You guys know that? He cares more about what you're allowing into your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions than he cares about you having a six-pack. He, not beer, like six-pack here, you know what I mean? Uh, he cares more about these things, and you got to understand that. And so we say, if I want to make a decision that's going to honor God, then I'm going to pay attention of what's going on inside. Now, Outside is important, too. I got nothing wrong with exercising. I got nothing wrong with working out. I think getting fit is good if you're getting fit for the right reasons. So you got to ask yourself, what is your motivation for wanting to get fit? If you tell me, my motivation for getting fit is so when I walk in a room, every eye turns and notices me when I come in. If that's your motivation, that's no bueno, right? That translates no good, all right? If you say your motivation is, uh, I, I, you know, I, I want some muscle so I can fill this muscle shirt up so I can look good when I go out, you know, so I can take my shirt off and walk around and have everybody notice me. If that's your motivation, that's not a good motivation. If you say, oh, I want, I want all the girls to notice me or I want all the guys to notice me, that's, my, that's not a good motivation. You see, getting fit is good, but motiv that motivation being wanting people to notice you and it being about me, 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 I, 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 I want to look good, I want this, that is not a godly motivation at all. So we have a good action with a poor motivation. So what we have to do is we have to say, okay, what is the action that I want and what is the motivation behind it? This is, this is the next question you have to answer. So if you say, my resolution, I want to get fit, I want to exercise, my next question is, what is your motivation? You see, sometimes when we realize our motivation is bad, we can change our motivation so that that action becomes good. For example, some of you guys know this about me. One thing I do is, is I'm a runner. Like, I like to run. I run a lot. I like it, and I do it. But what you may not know is the story behind the story, like why I started running. I started running because my mom died when she was 53 years old from a heart attack. And I started to realize her genes are in my body <laughs> and uh, that I am going to do what I can to keep my heart healthy because the odds are stacked against me in my life. And so that's how I started running. My motivation for running, I always say this prayer. I say, God, you can take me whenever you want, but I'm not going to help you. You know what I mean? In other words, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to try to be healthy, as healthy as I can. I'm not going to help you in the process. You take me whenever you want me, but I'm going to fight you just a little bit. Why? Because I want to see my kids grow up. I want to see my kids graduate. I, I, I want to develop a relationship with my wife that's getting stronger and stronger each and every single year. I want to watch the awesome faith community of the place grow and, and learn in their knowledge and do great and mighty exploits in this world for God. I want to see these things come to pass. See, that's my motivation. So we realize we have an action, so we have to know what is the motivation behind that action. Those two things line up. And so maybe you're like, okay, okay, I get that. I got to have the right motivation. I'm going to give you another idea. You're like, okay, I want to get healthy. I want to work out. Another option is find someone to do it with. 
But understand that your time together is more about developing a relationship with them so that you can reflect the light and the glory of God into their lives. Maybe they know Jesus, so you're going to stand with them and you're going to pray and you guys are going to talk about God and talk about the Holy Spirit and what God is doing in your life. You're taking advantage of that time with that person to communicate. Maybe you work out with someone that doesn't know Jesus, but you allow them to see the light and the love of God. That You, you are bold in your conversations on how you talk about the goodness and glory of God to them. You, you, you are taking advantage of that moment to make him big in the life of somebody else. You know, why do it alone? Go out there, get yourself a partner, and make it happen, you know? That was me pre-Christmas. Uh, yeah, the holiday's been tough on me. Uh, all right, so, so working out, that's, that's one idea. It's not a bad goal. It's not a bad resolution, right? But it's what is the motivation behind the resolution. We've got to understand that. Number two resolution that's out there all the time, it deals with money. Deals with finances, right? I need to make more money. I need to, I, I'm going to save for my kids college this year. I'm going to pay off my bills. I'm finally going to get rid of these medical bills. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. We see this all the time. Money, money, money. Money has to do with these resolutions that come up. Now, I got to tell you that Jesus talked a lot about money. He wasn't afraid to talk about money. He communicated about money a lot. In fact, we see in the book of Luke, if you got your Bible, you can open up to the book of Luke, chapter 12, Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, so you know you're right around there already. Luke chapter 12, we read a story that Jesus gives us having to do with money. Check out what he says. He says, then he, Jesus, said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Man, we could stop right there, couldn't we? I mean, did you hear what he said? Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, in the abundance of stuff. I do not care what culture tells you. Stuff will never, is not the purpose of life. Gaining more things, gaining more stuff is not what this is all about. It's about so much more, okay? And after he said that, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, he follows it up and he tells a story. Listen to the story Jesus tells. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. The guy thought to himself, what shall I do? He says, I have no place to store my crops. And then he says, ding, this is what I'll do. Comes up with a plan. And his plan is simply this. He says, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger ones, right? bigger barns, and I'm going to store all of my surplus there, all the stuff that I have. And I'm going to say to myself, he said, I'm going to say, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry, right? Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. The American dream, right? Isn't that what it's all about? Finding the beach, sitting there, getting your thing, watching the waves come up. That's what it's all about. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry, but the story doesn't stop there. It says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Man, I love that last sentence. I mean, did you hear that? He said, this is how it'll be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. This week, those three words just continue to come up, rich towards God. What does that mean, rich towards God? And I started to think about it really practically. What does that look like in my life? And I think about when I, when I look at my life, rich towards God says that God is, is sitting on the throne of my life. God is sitting on the throne of my heart. You see, there's always going to be a battle in our life of who takes that uh, position, whether it's God or money. Let me put it in a real practical example. Your bank closes down, loses all the money that you have in there, right? So you end up penniless. You have no house. You have no place to stay. Where would you be? Some people practically had that happen not that long ago when we saw the markets crashed and retirements wiped out and they look and everything that they've worked at and they built and they tried to save was completely gone. How did they react? Did they lose it all? 
If money sat on the top of that security in their life, they did. However, if God was on the top, then they didn't because God was still there. He who has a cattle on a thousand hills was still, you know, think about this. In your life, is, does your security come from your savings or does your security come from your Savior? See the difference? In your savings, it's what you have, what you've earned, what you've accumulated, your gifts, your talents, your abilities to make wealth, right? Or if your trust is in your Savior, it doesn't matter where you're working, how much you're getting paid, because he's first in your life, and he's going to take care of all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Make sense? So perspective, who's sitting at the top of your life? Paul was communicating with his disciple Timothy in the book 1 Timothy, chapter 6, starting in verse 17. He talks about money. And he talks about how to make sure that money doesn't take the place of God on the throne of your life. Listen to his words. He said this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. It's very important that we see something there, that Paul, as he was communicating to Timothy, never said that there was anything wrong with wealth. Never said that, you know, he doesn't say, command those who are rich, right, that they are bad people. Never said that. There's nothing wrong with that. What he communicates, is says, find those who are rich and tell them not to be arrogant, right? That's good, That's good news, not to be arrogant. I got to tell you, I've met people who have a lot that are arrogant, and I've met people who didn't have a lot, and they're arrogant too. Arrogant doesn't matter. You can be arrogant no matter where you're at. He's saying, don't be arrogant. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. But in that, don't put your trust in wealth and don't be arrogant. And he follows it up with this. But to put their hope in God, what does that mean? God's at the top, right? God's at the top. He's not money, not stuff. God's there. Put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then listen to this. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, and to be willing to share. For some of us, how do we keep God at the top? How do we keep him in his proper position in our life? Paul just told us how to do it. He said, in our lives, if we'll do good, if we will be rich in good deeds, if we will be generous with what we have, and if we'll be willing to share with others, then we're keeping God at the top. The th on the throne for our lives. He said, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I don't know if you caught that last one, but that, that's very profound, that they would take hold of the life that is truly life. You know, a lot of us, all of us that are here right now, we have life. In other words, we breathe, right? We breathe in life. We exhale life. But there is a difference between this life that we breathe and the life that we are called to have. Does that make sense? We can breathe life but not truly have life. That there is an incredible having of life that comes when we operate according to what Paul is encouraging Timothy to live by. When we live with open hands. We say, God, it's all yours anyway. I'm going to be generous and I'm going to do good and I'm not going to be arrogant in my life, but I'm going to walk in humility and I'm going to walk in love. Andy Stanley is a pastor, and he recently came out with a book called Fields of Gold. And Fields of Gold is about stewardship. It's about money, and it puts a really, really cool perspective on things because he breaks it down. It's just a thin book, and it's so simple. And he breaks it down into four areas. And I want to tell you because, you know, money is an issue in our life, and as we enter into 2014, I want you to think about these four different areas for your life. The first thing that he challenges people to do is this. He, he challenged them to give generosity, make giving the first priority in their life. So hey, before other things happen, to make that a priority, that this is going to be a priority in my life. And then the second thing that he says is really, really interesting. He says, make it a fixed percentage. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people talk about tithing 10%. Andy Stanley doesn't make a big deal about it. He says, wherever you're at, start there. Start at that percentage. Start right where you are. And then the next one he says, and then after you start there, progressively increase that percentage over time. What he's saying is as time goes on, continually become more and more generous with the money that you have coming into your life. 
You know, there's a pastor by the name of Rick Warren out of Orange County in California, wrote a book, a really popular book, The Purpose Driven Life. What many of you guys may not know about uh, Rick Warren is that all that money that came in from the book, he gave 90% of it away. He did what was called a reverse tithe. In other words, he chose to live on 10% and to give away 90. Now, the interesting thing about that story is when he gave away 90, he ended up, so much came in, he paid back his church for every dime they had ever paid him paid back everyone who had ever done anything and never had to work in another area other than that money came in when he gave away 90% of what he had coming in. That's interesting. You see, that's the reality. We can't outgive God. When we try to hold on tight to our stuff, we find we never, never get more. But when we stand with open hands, God freely pours blessing into our life. Last one, guys, is this. When we're looking at those resolutions and all the many things that we have to do, everything that you have in that list is going to cost time. It's the one thing that's going to cost each and every single person that's here. Whatever we decide to do with our time is going to take from our time. And if you choose to take from one area to give to another, you've got to make sure that you're taking and giving in those right areas. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, Paul says these words to the church in Ephesus. He says, be very careful, church, then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. You know, as we enter into this, this next year, I want you to think about your actions. How are you spending your time? How are you spending your life? There's going to be some things that you're going to make a resolution to do, and they're going to be great. You're going to look at them through this filter. They're going to honor God. They're going to be loving other people, and I just want you to take them. I just want you to start doing them. I just want you to start implementing them. They're good things. They're good for your life, and they're good for others. Go ahead and do it. But there's going to be other things that are going to come up, and you're going to look at them, and they're going to need some tweaking a little bit. There's some things that you have on your list that are just about you, 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 me, 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 I, I, I. And what you got to do is you got to take that thing, and you got to tweak it a little bit. What does that mean? It means you have to really say, why do I want this thing so bad? Do I want it so people will notice me? Do I want it because people will look at me? You know, for some of us, it's the things that we have. Why do you really want that thing? Is it because it's practical for your life, or is it because people are going to think you're a better person because you have it? What's the motivation behind it? There's going to be some things that you're just going to have to tweak a little bit. And let me tell you this. I mean, this is the cold, honest truth. There's going to be other things on your list. They're untweakable. Instead, you're just going to have to go and you're just going to have to trash them. You may believe that becoming a 765th level knighted wizard on your video game is important, but it isn't. <laughs> I can imagine God meeting you at the pearly gates saying, I'm so happy that you perform your 535th headshot on Call of Duty. I was getting worried that you weren't going to make it at 4,098, 4, but you really showed up, son. <laughs> God won't ever say that, I can almost promise it. <laughs> I, why? Because these are things that sometimes they're wasting your time, your energy, your focus, your strength, your life is being sucked away from these things. They need to be thrown into the trash. But there's other things that are going to make it through. Some today that you know in your life that things have to make it through because you know things have to change. You're in a place right now where you don't want 2014 to be like 2013, and there's some things that are going to have to take a greater priority in your life. When you look at those things, how many are really honoring God? How many are really putting him first? Think about some of the goals we could have. Like, like maybe this year, you know, we're offering Bible college classes. We're like, man, I'm going to take one of those classes. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. I'm going to stretch. You know, it may be hard. I may have to make my, my schedule different. I may have to drive a little bit. I may have to do this or that, but I'm going to make that a priority. I want to learn. I want to grow in my faith a little bit more. Or maybe for some of you, like, man, this year I want to pray more than I prayed last year. So I'm going to set a time every single day, and I'm going to start praying. Or I'm going to find someone that's going to hold me accountable, and we're going to do this thing together. Or maybe for some of you, it's like, man, I remember when someone shared with me the good news of Jesus. I want to share that with someone. I want to share one person every month. I want to share the good news of Jesus with them. What if you just did that? Twelve lives to be impacted. But it has to do with your perspective. Are you choosing the right things for your life? You know, it reminds me of a story about a guy who was always in trouble with the law. Man, the cops were always looking for this guy. He went into a confessional one day and talked to the priest and he talked to the priest. He said, I'm changing my ways, Father. And the priest said, have you finally seen the light, my son? He said, no, but I'm feeling the heat. <laughs> In our lives, some of us need to change because we're feeling the heat, right? 
we know that if we continue this way, we're going to end up dead, we're going to end up addicted, we're going to end up broken, we're going to end up on the street. This is not the way for us to live. We're feeling the heat. We know that this is our last chance. We know that something desperately needs to change. And if you need to change because you're feeling the heat, I think that's great. That's the moment when you go to the doctor and the doctor looks at you and says, if you don't change the way you're living, you're going to die. Okay, well, I know I'm going to die eventually, but I'm not going to make that any, any sooner. And so I'm going to change the way that I'm living, right? That's feeling the heat. You're feeling the heat in that area. Now, there's others that maybe you're not feeling the heat, but you're still inspired to change. And that's beautiful because you're starting to see the light. You're starting to see the light that there's a better choice for you. There's a better life to live. That when you put God first, things come into a better perspective. You're in the place where great change, true lasting change is truly possible in this moment. But I got to tell you guys that if you really want that for your life, if you really want real and lasting change, it's only going to happen when he's on the throne of your life. You can't do it in and of yourself anymore that you have to give over that control completely to him. Make sense? Let me pray with you. Bow your heads with me. God, I want real lasting change in my life, and I believe that so many here want real lasting change in their life. And we know that that real lasting change can only happen, Father, when we see you in a proper perspective, when we know, Lord God, that you are our true Lord, and Savior. And maybe you're here today and you're like, man, that's, that's the change I need to happen in my life. I need to put God first. I'm sitting on the throne right now. or some, Something is sitting on that throne right now, and you need God to sit on that throne. If you're here, I want to I wanna pray with you when you say, yes, that's what I want. I want God to sit on the throne of my life. If you're here and, and you want to commit your lives to Jesus, and, and you want to say, Jesus, I want to put you first in my life. I'm giving it all over to you. I want to just say a prayer with you. If you're here and that's where, where you're at, you know this is your moment, this is your day. You want 2014 to be different than 2013. I just want you to lift your hand up. I'm going to say a prayer with you. I'm not going to call you to front. I'm not going to embarrass you. If you're here, I want you to have the opportunity to put Jesus first. I see you, I see you, I see you. Who else would say, yes, that's what I want in my life today? I see you. If you've already committed your life to Jesus, I want you to join those that are praying this prayer for the very first time, putting him first in their lives. Say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I believe that you lived, that you died, that you rose again, and that you have a plan for my life. I turn away from everything that takes me further from you, and I choose to run to you today and every day for the rest of my life. Amen.